Good morning, beloved. Peace be with you. Last week we heard one of the uh, famous summary statements of the gospel message of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so whoever will believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. And we looked again at believing in Jesus, meaning to entrust our lives to him, to place our lives in his hands. And we really continue that same theme of trusting our lives to, in Jesus' hands or entrusting our lives into the hands of our Heavenly Father so that we can receive eternal life. Uh, and this is actually what we'll see in the gospel today, what Jesus, uh, what John, the author, is calling glorification or gl- being glorified. This is what it means for Jesus to be glorified. We see him ultimately entrusting his life into the hands of his heavenly Father. And we'll see ultimately, and, uh, not, too, not too long from now, on Good Friday, he does this when he says, Into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. But this is kind of a, really, it's a life practice we do. Just that little command where Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. All those le- these little acts of self-denial that we practice all year long, but very intentionally during Lent, are preparing us for that ultimate act of self-denial, or that ultimate act of, into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit to you, because I trust you, and I trust your love for me. So let's just walk through part of our gospel passage today. Uh, We might make it halfway through, but uh, pull out some good insights, but focusing, centering on this, what it means for the Son of Man to be glorified and for us to be glorified or to enter into Jesus' glory with him, because he, remember, he always says, come follow me, come follow me. So let's just pick out some good insights and, um, and we'll do a couple Catholic pop quizzes along the way to make sure we're awake this morning, you know. So the beginning, so it says, John says, some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip. So they came to worship at the Passover feast. So where, are, where is everyone? In Jerusalem. All right, good. That's right. We said a couple of weeks ago, talking about the many feasts that Israel had, but there was three travel feasts where they have to go to Jerusalem to celebrate that feast. So it's just good. You know, we, as we're reading, we want to read with a full consciousness, and it helps us paint the picture in our head when we're reading. Okay, they're all in Jerusalem for this feast, the Passover feast. So they come to Philip, uh, who's from Bethsaida in Galilee, and we want to see Jesus. Um, So Philip goes and tells Andrew, then Philip and Andrew go both and tell Jesus, Jesus, some Greeks are here, and they want to see you. And Jesus says, he answers, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Huh? (laughs) Don't don't you think he would say, okay, great, tell him to come by after breakfast tomorrow, you know, or something. (laughs) That's his hour, right? Some people want to see you. Father, can I talk to you after Mass? The hour has come. For me to be glorified. You'd look at me and be like, huh? Father's going goofy, more goofy than normal. What's Jesus saying here? He, right, he's teaching his disciples, uh, helping them recognize the fulfillment of God's promises. So we've been talking about that since the last Advent. Remember, God has he's made so many promises in the Old Testament, and he has appointed times in salvation history when he's going to fulfill those promises, when he's going to keep his word and fulfill those promises. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples, ah, oh, this is a sign that God's about to fulfill one of his promises and glorify the Son of Man. See, it was written in the Old Testament scriptures that, now now remember, Jesus um, said different times in his ministry, I have only come for the Jews. I've only come to minister to the Jews. I'm not here for for Gentiles. Remember, he's talking to the Samaritan woman, and and she wants her daughter to be saved, freed from a demon. And Jesus says, look, I just came to minister to the Jews, (laughs) you know. I'm not here for Samaritans, for Gentiles. I'm just here for the Jewish people. And she begs him, and he ends up healing her daughter anyway. Um, 
because, because this was one of the signs in the Old Testament that was written that when the Gentiles, when the Greeks, and then when the non-Jews do start coming to Jesus and acknowledging he's the Messiah, when the Greeks are, when the Gentiles are woken up to say the Messiah is here, then that's actually the sign that the Messiah is going to enter into his passion and death and resurrection. What John calls Jesus' glorification. That's going to be the moment when Jesus entrusts his whole life and death to the Father. So Jesus is teaching his disciples, recognize the fulfillment of God's promises is happening among you right now. Did you just catch that, Andrew, Philip? See, the Greeks are coming now. The hour, the word hour, there's two words for time in in the Greek. One is kind of watch time. The other is God's appointed time. So God has an appointed time for the Son of Man to be glorified. He has an appointed time for Jesus to enter into his passion and death and resurrection. He has an appointed time for Jesus' death. When Jesus has accomplished his mission, which sounds crazy because don't you think, couldn't he be alive a few more years and heal some more people and, and get a bigger gathering? Couldn't, couldn't he have done more? But that's all that he needed to do to accomplish his part of God's mission. It, the mission continues with the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus, with all of us. We all have a part to play in continuing God's mission of reconciling the world to himself. Jesus' part was done. So his appointed time had come. Do you ever think about perhaps God has an appointed time for each one of our deaths? Each one of our deaths is in part of God's plan. For when we have finished our part of accomplishing his mission, then it's time to go be with him. And if we're not done with our part of the mission, we're hanging out still for a long time, huh? Or if he gave some of us more to do than others, we're hanging out for a long time. You know, do you think accidents are really accidents? Like God can't figure out an accident? Or really, you know, cancer or some other sickness stole somebody's life? Like cheated them out of life? You really think that God can't figure all that out ahead of time and have appointed time for our deaths? Just because we don't get it? You ever think that perhaps you and I won't leave this earth until we finish accomplishing God's mission, our part in God's mission, if we want to, if we're willing if we're willing, could we, not, could we say that nothing can stop us? Not even death, not even some sickness or disease, not even COVID-19. Because if somebody kills me tonight and God's not finished with me, don't you think he'll raise me from the dead? He did with Lazarus. Don't you think God's that powerful? God's not done with us until he's done with us. This is part of the teaching. God has an appointed time for us, you guys. This is another reason for us to not give in to slavery, to fear. So next, Jesus says, okay, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and now he's going to tell us what it means to be glorified. You know, we could think, oh, glory is wonderful. Yeah, all right. Bring on the glory, Lord. What does it mean to be glorified? Now he tells you, amen, amen, I say to you. Amen, amen. When you say that back to back, amen, amen, that's solemn oath swearing. That's Jesus saying, put my life on the line for this one. If I'm wrong, kill me. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. In other words, Jesus is is, uh, talking about his passion and death and resurrection here. That for him to be glorified, he's going to have to be this grain of wheat that dies. 
But if he dies, he'll produce much fruit. Why? Because he's going to be raised from the dead. And he, he brings forth life for the world. You ever do any gardening? And you plant some seeds around? You know? What would you do if you bought a packet of seeds and you plant those things out there and nothing happened, huh? You say, what a bunch of wasted seeds. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. Well, Jesus is that seed. And you and I are that seed. And what he's saying is here, part of our purpose is to die to being merely a seed. So we can be more. So you ever think, he's, talking, he's saying basically we were, we were we, our, part of our purpose includes being resurrected. That's part of why we were made, to be, enter into resurrected eternal life. If we don't do it, if we don't die to ourself and our self-will and our self-plans, what a wasted life that is. That seed looked good. It was in good dirt, had some good water, and it all went to waste because nothing came of it. Then Jesus, so Jesus, he, there's one example. Now he, there's another example he gives following that. What it means for, uh, for him and for us, for him to be glorified, for us to enter into his glory. Second example, he says, whoever loses his life, wh whoever loves his life, loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. So what's he talking about here? Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever loves his life, think about it like this. You ever said or heard somebody say, I love my life right now. Everything's falling into place. I have a good job, good car, just got a nice house in Mission Hills, you know. I'm in Upper Mission Hills, not the Lower Mission Hills, you know. I got a nice, I got a nice woman with a nice couple kids, good family raising up. I love my life right now. I love the way my life is. Don't touch my life right now, God. Don't mess with this right now. I like the way it is. That's, see, that's what he's talking about. I love the way I've built up my life right now. Got a good portfolio I'm building up. Stocks are going great. Good dividends over here. Little bit of interest over there. You know, I got good businesses. I add this business to my portfolio. Things are going good. I like my life right now. I love it. I love with the way my life is right now. Don't touch my life, Lord. That's what Jesus is saying when he says, whoever loves his life like that will actually lose it. Why? Because we, we know we don't take any of that with us. That does us no good for eternal life. It doesn't, that's, doesn't build up any, that's all that building up on earth doesn't build up anything for us in heaven. Right? Shouldn't, shouldn't we be, maybe we're thinking of the, the story of Jesus with the rich young man. When the rich young man came up to him and said, Master, teacher, rabbi, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you already know the answer. Obey the commandments, you know. It's in the, it's in the scriptures. He said, well, I've done all that, you know. I checked off my Sunday obligation all the time, every Sunday. You know, I did a couple of rosaries here and there, some novenas. You know, I did my prayer before meal, grace before meal, you know. I'm, I haven't killed nobody yet, you know, yet. <laughs> and Jesus says, you're right. You've done pretty good. But there is one thing you're still lacking for eternal life. Go and sell all that you have. Let go of this life you've built up for yourself. Give to the poor and then come follow me. And you will have treasure in heaven, says the Lord. 
And it says he went away sad because he had many things. He had built up a nice life for himself. He was comfortable with, secure with. He loved his life. But what is the pattern you and I see in the scriptures of everyone who Jesus calls to come follow me and they do, what's the pattern we see? They leave everything. They, that life they built up for themselves, they let it all go for him. It doesn't mean we can't have things, we can't build up life and try to be secure and provide very well for ourselves or our family. What it means is we can't hold on to it so tight we're not willing to let it go. It means that we can't love our life and what we built up for our life more than we love God. That's what it means. So he goes on to continue. Whoever hates his life, a better translation is just whoever does not love his life in that way. Whoever loves God more than he or she loves their life will actually preserve their life for eternity. You know, if we're holding on so tight to our life, there's no room for us to hold on to God. There's things that God has for us that he wants to give us, but if our arms and our lives are full of what we have for ourselves, there's no room to receive what God has for us. That's what we've been talking about this Lenten season, making more room for, for God in our lives, making more room for the Holy Spirit in our lives, and it means letting go of things. We're letting God in to rearrange our lives. You know, letting God in to do a little spring cleaning inside. You know, don't you always feel good when you can get, get rid of a few things in your house and declutter a little bit, you know? That's what it is. God, I give you permission to come in and declutter. I don't want to be a hoarder. Huh? I don't want to be a hoarder. Come in with your Holy Spirit and declutter my life. You know? Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, there also my servant will be. And where is Jesus? He's entering into his glorification, his death and resurrection, his total entrustment of his life to his Father. And he's saying, where I am, in the hands of my heavenly Father, so will my servant be. So will my followers be. But to get in the hands of our Heavenly Father, we've got to let go of our lives, you know, and trust Him and say, okay, catch me, Father. Catch me. Where is the Holy Spirit stirring up in your life right now? Say, let me in here. <laughs> You know, everything looks pretty neat and tidy, but it's because you packed it all in this room. Let me in that room to declutter a few things still, you know. When we think about that, loving our life and building up our life and getting everything the way we like it, you know, is there anything in your life like that you don't want God to touch or mess with? Because that's where the Holy Spirit's stirring right now, saying, that's where I want to go. That's where I want you to let go and entrust your life more fully into the hands of our Father. So, Father, we thank you so much for your truth and for all you're doing in our lives and for all the ways that you're continuing to show us we can trust you. We can trust you with our life, with our loved ones, with our eternal life, and even with the moment of our death whenever that appointed time comes. We pray you'd continue to help us to open our hearts and our lives more fully to your Holy Spirit, to make more room for your Holy Spirit in our lives so we can better accomplish our part of your mission on earth, of reconciling the whole world to you. We pray all these things together in Jesus' name, amen.